Good morning, it's the 3rd of May, it's about half 10 and we're at Cushion Dun and Cushion Dun's actually quite small. An ancient ferry port, a stone's throw from Scotland, about 15 miles from Scotland actually. Uh, you can see the Mullican Tower and all the rest of it. Uh, special place beloved by artists and poets. And there's the uh, Cushion Dun caves that were used as a backdrop for the Game of Thrones, something happening in the Game of Thrones. And this is where we are here. There's Glenarm, there's Kernlock, there's Gan Point, Glenarf, Cushion Daw, and up to Cushion Dun, and then on round to Tower. Torhead and Fairhead and Bally Castle. Hi. Hello. Hello, doggy. There's a long long sweeping beach here and there were two clans, there was the, the O'Neill clan and there was the MacDonald clan and they didn't get on too well and Shane O'Neill, the leader of the O'Neill clan, uh, lost his life at um, the castle at Cushion Dun. The poet Mara O'Neill recalls her home at Rockport Lodge in Cushendon in the poem Grace for Light. Yeah. Aye. There's the old the old uh, sailing ship. After his father's death, Shane O'Neill crowned himself King of Ulster and demanded his uh, father's title, Earl of Tyrone. That's the O'Neill's from Tyrone. Um, they, they were related to Con O'Neill, of course. They refused and mounted a campaign to unseat him, which failed. Shane was already recognised as in Ireland as Gaelic Lord in Ulster and was almost untouchable in his power base. He initiated his own brother and nephew's death. He was a nice boy. Fought with the, and against his father, all in pursuit of his ambitions. He became extremely rich, owned vast lands, herds, cattle including Dundrum, and time he turned his sights on the McDonald's, whom he saw as his only real threat, and there's Dundrum Castle. County down. Shane O'Neill was killed in 1567 during a meeting with the O'Donnells at Cross Crean, an old church site in the townland of Ballantyreen. Um, near Castle Cara. His remains are said to have been hurriedly buried in the nearby churchyard and his head sent, and that nice, his sent, head sent to be publicly displayed in Dublin Castle. A cairn to Shade O'Neill was erected on the high ground overlooking Cushion Dun in 1908. So this is Cushion Dun. And it's, uh, it's a bit of a, it's, it's really small actually, it's a bit of a hole in the hedge and you blink once and you'll miss it. And that's it back there. And this is where you park. And there's a sign on the side of that building there in case you get lost. And I've come along and I've found the old church centre. And I think this is a, a church of Ireland, or originally a church of Ireland. And the famous local poet, 
Mora O'Neill. Poet and novelist lived in Cushington and attended this church. So there you go. Couldn't find her grave, mind you. A significant group of wee cottages here are the Maud cottages. I think these were built by the the Baron of Cushion Dunn right at the outset outset of the village. Good to see them still in existence. And this is a bit of the history of the place. Long before uh, clock William Ellis was commissioned by Lord Cushion Dunn to design a new village square. The settlement of Cushion Dunn was well established, but really this fella, Lord Cushion Dunn, really established the, the, the village. And there, there, perched high above the village was Castle Cara, which watched over this landing place since the 1300s. There's this uh, rather flamboyant guy, uh, Clock William Ellis, 1937. And over there's Maud's Cottages. And there's the old Castle Cara. And there's the key. Uh, totally devoid of protection even for the smallest vessels. And that was uh, said by Alexander Nimmo. I wonder was there anything to direct Nimmo in 1821. They've wandered about. The well, ducks were sitting in the, in the middle of the car park there. <laughs> oh, what's this? Oh, this is what I would... This is... It commemorates a local legend of love and tragedy. No that's, that's right, this is what we were looking for. I wouldn't have known about this, uh, to find this. This is the famous full due seat. It was erected by the Cushendal Gun Development Association in 2013. It commemorates a local legend of love and tragedy. It's actually uh, a true legend known as the full Jew story which has been told in this area for over 200 years. The tombstone 1803 associated with this story may be viewed in the graveyard of St. Patrick's Church Craigie. Cushion done. And this is the Portland stone uh, add on to this, uh, this seat. And we're going to search for the uh, the f the the actual grave in uh, in St Patrick's graveyard because it, it's just a, tra a tale of tragedy uh, where a young fellow went off to he was he was due to be married and he went off to uh, on a last sailing trip and the full due I think refers to uh, a wage that you only got paid if you uh, uh, completed your voyage. He's going away for three weeks and, and he fell from the mast and his, his fiance was waiting for him and and whenever she heard she went out in the middle of the night and, and lay on his tombstone and, and, and died and they were only, eight, they were only 18. So there, boy so that's great finding that. And there's the Glen Dunn Hotel that looks a wee bit worse for wear. And this is us. There's the the uh, and there's the Cushion Dunn Hotel. And there's the uh, the bridge over the Dunn River Dunn. And there's Mary McBride's. Uh, famous watering hole 
Look at that, the bluebells, it's not nice. Yeah, Mary McBride's uh, famous pub on the corner here. Uh, it's got a Game of Thrones door on it. We must have driven past that car park entrance. You were pointing at Mary McBride. That's right. Turn your camera off. No, I want to get the, the front of the pub. Because it's got a, a nice wee bit of street art on the front. That's an Aston Martin. Ah, very nice. <laughs> yeah, the little black door. Ah, Mr. and Mrs. Aston Martin taking off there. I took the way birds know and walk in cushion done. That's what it says up the left side. Uh, it says, I, I dreamt of gentle Ireland beneath the northern lights. And this uh, painting was done by Kieran Gallagher in 2021. The waves that broke on Ireland were calling me at night. And there's a poem here. That's class. And unfortunately we can't get into McBride's because it's not open. But uh, this is for my friend Billy uh, McCutcheon from Newton Arts, and there's an old Singer sewing machine and it's in, a, in, in, in the window here. It's a wee bit, uh, it's not in great nick now. But he'd be interested to see that. And there's the bar, I don't know whether you can see in there. I'd love to get, I've got in there, but that's the way it goes. And this is a Game of Thrones bus. And they're heading round to the same place that we are heading round. They're heading round to the uh, Cushion Dunn Caves where Game of Thrones was filmed. And the stop on this bridge and the, the uh, Cravat traffic jam in the, in the weekends and their hit and run job. They don't buy anything, so the locals say, and then they head away on. There's a goat sculpture here, sculpted by Deborah Brown and presented, go on ahead, go on ahead, and presented by the people of Cushendale in 2002. A goat was the last animal to be called, to be culled in the fit and mouth outbreak of 2001. So they're all culled. Quite a good sculptor. And we're getting a bit of action here. Well, we watch the world burn, burn on the edge of existence. No, I don't know. And here's the people out of the Aston Martin coming along. And we've stumbled across the caves that were used in Game of Thrones. And there's busloads of people arrive to see these every weekend and during the week as well. And there, there's the openings.
Right. Yes. You see that rock formation? That's sort of like that's volcanic, a scoriaceous rock. You get that at the Giants Causeway as well. Oh, there's a bit of a sea arch there. Try to break your neck. Careful. And that looks like some dust. That'd be dullest, wouldn't it? Yes. So they would have collected and eaten. And stewed or whatever they did with it. And I'm recognizing all sorts of different accents here. People walking by. Now, how did they get up there? Look at the wee primula growing there. Not nice. And I was saying to Tanya that prior to Game of Thrones, nobody would have come near this place. They wouldn't have even known about it. Look at that rock formation, it's not good. Is that what is known as a conglomerate? I'm not, I can't remember from the geography. Sedimentary like. Or maybe it's not sediment. No, it's not sedimentary. Oof, look. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a conglomerate. It's a, uh, they, they, they were originally, I think they were originally sedimentary, and then they've been uh, they've been fused together, but with extreme heat. It certainly gives for an interesting effect on the ceiling there. They must be flooded. Oh, they're flooded. Oh, yes, in the high tide. They'd be the, sure the waters. You can see evidence of, of water. I'm surprised there's no notice board. There's all the kids getting their footies tick. The place is riddled with, with caves. I imagine that this kind of rock is easy to uh, 
for a way of action to, to, to eat them too. Oh, there's a Game of Thrones chair. There, somebody has a sense of humor. <laughs> Game of Thrones chair. I don't know. Ah, oh, there's the Game of Thrones uh, notice board, which has been rather defaced. Game of Thrones, blah blah blah. Caves was used as a location near Storm's End at Stormlands in Season 2 and although we see this location only once, the consequences of what happened here are far reaching. Following a parley between the brothers where Stannis Barthon fails in his attempt to get Rainy to accept him as true king, Stannis orders Davos Seaworth to smuggle Melisander ashore to a cove situated below Rini's camp. There Davos watches in horror as the Red Priestess gives birth to a shadow creature which ultimately kills Rini. And you wonder how these Game of Thrones location spotters actually found this place. Because it's not widely known. It is now. Well, there's more and more uh, tour guide buses, tour guided the bus buses arriving as we speak. And there's my old chum Gavin Neely from Newton Breda High School days. He's the one with the white hair, and he's a tour guide. I taught with Gavin for at least 25 years and he's earning a, a wee bit of extra money doing this tour guiding and boy he can talk he's worse he's, he's worse than me and you never know who you, you might run into brilliant stuff I walked up from uh, McBride's pub there on the corner, past the, uh, the tour bus, buses, and these are uh, a clatter, more uh, old buildings, dating from the time that this, uh, the Baron of Cushion Dunn built them. And they look really class. I've never seen this kind of architecture before. And there's a date up there, of course it's written in Latin. And uh, my Latin isn't too good. So, whenever I get home I'll, I'll try and uh, work out what that is. Great, there's a notice board. Look at the look at the blossom on those cherry trees. Isn't that lovely? It's not beautiful. I just love it. That's the old Church of Ireland Church up there uh, I discovered. So let's get the notice board. How often one may see new houses that are like swaggering strangers. And this is Clock Will Williams Ellis who uh, constructed or designed these houses. The village you see today owes much of its character to this guy. Uh, 1883 through to um, 
1977. He's not long dead. The famous Welsh architect was commissioned by Ronald McNeil, that's the first and last Lord Cushion Dunn, and his Cornish wife, Maud, to redesign the centre of the village. And they based it on a, on a, a Cornish uh, village uh, with massard roofed houses sloped on each of the four sides of the roof. The result is a unique combination of traditional whitewashed dwellings sitting alongside others that appear to have been transplanted from another time and another place. And there's the Causeway School. And it was designed by uh, Clock Williams Ellis. And that's just up a bit from the Giants Causeway. And this is um, Lord Crusham down, Lord Cushing Dunn, known to political opponents as Lord Crusham Down, made his mark in Westminster Parliament. He once threw a book at the head of Winston Churchill during a home rule debate. Later he was to become financial secretary to the Treasury, standing six foot uh, and six and a half feet. He used to claim that he was the tallest barrister of his time. He died in 1934. Uh, his first wife, Maud, and that's Maud Cottages, are, are named. Died in Cushion Don and is buried in the graveyard surrounding the little Church of Ireland. Her epitaph reads, A Cornish woman who loved the glens and their people. And there were bathing, resident, bathing lodges, uh, summer residences, or bathing, bathing lodges were becoming increasingly popular. And the sur surviving big houses around here are Rockport, Glen Mona, and Glen Don Lodge. It's not great. Love that. And this is uh, Moira O'Neill, uh, was as famous as Thomas Moore, mother of the Irish writer Molly Keane. She was born Agnes Nestor Shakespeare Higginson and was brought up in Rockport Lodge. Her two best poems are probably Furry Lock about Loch Arena and Corrymeela. And there's Loch Arena, it's the, it's the Vanishing Lake, and it lies on the main road between Cushion Dunn and Bally Castle, called the Vanishing Lake because one day it is full of brown peat water, and the next day it is gone, it's cracked mud. At midnight it is said to be haunted by a coachman and horses, recalling when some 150 years ago a coach loaded with passengers galloped into the watery grave when the lake was full in full flood. Oh dear. Brilliant. I think this is the old Cushion Dunn school, possibly a national school. And up on the heights, up on the hill, is Castle, I think it's Castle Barra, the remains of. Yes, the old castle ruins here looking over Cushion Dunn. And I'm sure the walls there, if they could speak, could tell some stories of the O'Neills and the McDonald's. To drop in at Cushion Dunn, you might be surprised at what you come across. That's the beach away in the distance there. <laughs> 